so much of our job, and we've talked about this, you know, when we go to conferences, some of the conferences I've attended, there's more and more sessions on the psychology of investing, yes. not the X's and O's and yeah. what to invest. It's the psychology and it's managing those expectations. Welcome to the Market Moment. My name is Matt Walters here with Lee Mackey and a, uh, a kind of a guest now. Yeah, pretty <laughs> David much. Lee. David's not on the podcast very much anymore. It used to be a, a weekly thing for you, yeah. but uh, yeah, glad to have you on the on the show this week. Great to be here. Um, since, so kind of just jumping into it. So David, you know, founder of Mach One, author you know, last hey. year, published his first that's right. book. So that's exciting. So t- today we're going to talk some about that as well as a few other topics. But since we have David here with us, going to talk about the connection between demographics, market performance, the expectations versus reality in the stock market and how much is truly in our control. So specifically kind of setting David up for some some uh, points that you make in the book. And I've heard you talk a lot about demographics and the impact that has on the markets and the economy. Um, But you wrote in your book, Mission Focused, Purpose Driven, about a huge change in perspective. how you saw a pattern in birth rates in the economy. And I know you've, you've read a couple books and learned about this from a few people, but the U S economy is consumer driven. And if there are more consumers purchasing and selling goods than the economy, um, then there's more economic activity. So statistically speaking, uh, people spend more in their lifetime when they're in their 45 to 55 year old age range. So can you kind of, uh, just run with that, kind of explain what the thoughts behind the demographics and the impact that has on, the U.S. economy. Yeah, um, I talk about it a lot in the book, as you said, and as you also said. I mean, it, I can't take credit for the idea. I, I read it from when I was first getting into this business after a career uh, in the Air Force as a fighter pilot. I had to read everything I could get my hands on to try to learn about, to try to figure out what what does drive an economy and 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 uh, by extension markets and stock markets mm-hmm. right and uh so i read a book uh, after reading many books i came across one by a, a guy named harry dent he's a harvard trained economist and uh he laid out a case for why uh demographics specifically birth rate trends are kind of probably the key predictor of whether a nation's economy is going to be kind of in a boom cycle or a bust cycle um and he kind of essentially, in in my opinion, prove the point by showing what the U.S. economy did uh, after the baby boom. Mm -hmm. Uh, We all know the story of the baby boom, 1944, 45, soldiers come home from war. And uh, a lot of babies, a lot of babies get (laughs) produced. Yep. And uh, so birth rates, uh, we basically had the baby boom from 1945 to 1962. And as you said in your intro there, you know, most Consumers. people spend money yeah. in the Cons- 45 to 55 yeah. year old. And it makes sense. I mean, for anybody out there listening, if you're if you're in your mid 40s to mid 50s, you know exactly what we're talking about, right? Your kids are at at that stage of life where they're the most expensive. They're in college, maybe, and um, you know. Whereas if you're 20 years old and maybe single, or 20 years old, newly married, your your living expenses aren't nearly as much as if you've got two or three kids in college, right? And then after the kids get out of college or get out of high school or whatever it is they do and get join the workforce and you become an empty nester, naturally your your household spending uh, declines again. Mm-hmm. So for a variety of reasons, spending peaks in the mid 40s to mid 50s for the average American. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that, well, if 70% of our economy, our GDP is consumer spending based, if the peak spending demographic group is growing in numbers due to birth rate trends that occurred 45 to 50 years ago, you're probably going to have a growing economy today. And he kind of proved that by overlaying birth rate, uh, birth rate, uh, a plot of the birth rate essentially Mm -hmm. with overlaid with like the S and P 500 and the Dow Jones industrial average on a 45 year lag. And it was amazing how highly correlated the two plots were. Um, and so, you know, as a result, you know, back in 2005, 2006, 2007, which were my first two, three years in this business, I was warning all of our clients back then, hey, I think we've got a major uh, crash or correction coming due to birth rates peaking in 1962 on a 45-year lag. That's 2007. 
sure enough, 2008, we all remember that major market crash. And then we had the longest recovery from a recession in our lifetimes after the 2008 bust. Um, and I believe that is a, a major cause of that was simply demographic forces, right? From 1962 to 1973, birth rates declined every year, year over year. So from 2007 to basically 2018, due to birth rate trends, it was pretty predictable that we were going to have a recession, and um, and it ended up, you know, yeah, uh, coming it, true. Yeah, it can, it can give you an idea of like, hey, there's, there's going to be some pressure from a yes. spending perspective. You yes. don't necessarily know where that's going to come from. That's correct. But you, you can get an idea of, hey, there's going to be fewer people spending, you know, less money. And so somewhere, you know— asset prices are going to be impacted. That's right. Because people aren't spending as much or don't have as much money to spend. And so, yeah, I think it's a good kind of big picture perspective to exactly. look at. And then you try to dive into, okay, maybe where will we see that play out? Because each cycle yeah. could be different. Absolutely. Maybe it's impacted. There's, I mean, we all know, and you out there listening, you know, there is no crystal ball. There is no single factor that you can look at even demographics that you can say, well, we're going to have a great economy during this period of time and a bust economy during this period of time right. because economies are complex. And, you know, this is just looking at U.S. birth trends and U.S. Um, GDP. We're a global economy, so that plays into it. We've got immigration. That's a topic in the mm -hmm. news all the time. That plays into it. So um, there are other factors, but I do think that birth trends. It, Elon Musk happens to agree with me. Yeah. Uh, I've got articles here we can talk Have about. more babies. Yeah. I mean, it, Elon Musk is out there saying, hey, uh, the declining birth rate trend that we're seeing is going to be the, the is going to cause civilization to crumble. And, and again, I would say it doesn't take a genius to figure that out either. Right? Yeah. You know, it, it, it takes was, people to run the world. You know, a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if I was watching Bloomberg Finance or one of the business channels, but they were talking about how in China, their birth rate continues yeah. to decline yeah. and they are worried Japan too. about the future, yes. you know, of the Chinese economy that, you know, yeah, they don't have enough workers. Yeah. And they're talking about how for the first time, maybe it dropped below two or yeah, I don't, one and right. a half. It's I mean, like one and a half. Yeah, yeah. One and a half that for the articles. first time ever that, you know, there's a genuine concern that, yeah. you know, 30, 40 years from now, you know, what does the China economy look like? Yeah. And those are great examples. I mean, you've got Japan and China, you know, we're, birth rates have been low and you had China, time. you had the one child policy. That's right. Now they, you know, they're, they're just now, I think, well, I'm not saying just now, but they're, they're realizing the impact That's of that exactly from right. an economic perspective. Um, you know, when you try to manipulate something like that, it has lasting consequences. That's right. And, and on the note of Japan, I mean, some of you out there listening may remember back in the, I want to say, maybe the early 90s, there was a lot of concern that Japan was going to kind of become the world economic power. I don't know if you, you guys oh, yeah. remember yeah. that. Yeah, they sure. were buying up property left and right in the United States. And then what ended up coming back to bite them was this demographic thing. Mm -hmm. their, their population, they weren't having enough children years and years ago. And so their population uh, of young people just dramatically declined. And that, that's why Japan has kind of been mm -hmm. in a rut economically for quite some time. It's very much demographically related. You know, I'm, I'm looking here. <clears throat> I'm, I'm maybe cheating and looking ahead on our notes. But um, interesting that, you know, some people think that as the, a country's GDP rises, as a country becomes more economically sound, that the birth rate actually begins to drop. Um, and it does. And, and, I, and I don't know off the top of my head, in the U.S., is our birth rate dropping yeah. Oh, yeah. It is. In fact, uh, a lot of uh, some of the ex the articles here that I was reading preparing for this talked about how a lot of experts, y'all will remember this, uh, during the um, COVID pandemic, yeah. a lot of people thought, well, hey, with people being stuck at home, we're going to see a baby boom as yeah. a result. And it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And we were already kind of seeing ever since about 1992. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, birth rates have been declining again. So we had the baby boom, 45 to 62, baby bust, 62 to 73, echo boom, 73 to 92, and then birth rates kind of declining since again then. after that. Um, and so we'd been kind of in a in a long, slow decline, mm -hmm. and experts or that monitor this stuff were hoping we were going to see kind of a baby boom from COVID, and mm -hmm. it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I I think – you know, down the road, we're going to have potentially some economic issues as you know, a result. But uh, if I could go back to your original question, though, you're right. Um, 
birth rates do tend to decline as a country gets wealthier. You know, mm-hmm. people tend to have fewer children. They tend to invest more in those children's sure. college educations and things like that. And we know um, what the cost of education yeah. is doing. And so in, in, in my mind, I'm just kind of speculating, you know, as inflate, you know, we had COVID, yeah. but then we had, you know, hyperinflation, you know, for a period of time. And I wonder if that kind of played into the fact of like, you know, we can't afford. Oh, yeah. The, to, these to articles bring more talk, children yeah, into absolutely. the world. Absolutely. That plays into it. These articles talk about that, too, how, you know, during tough economic times, mm-hmm. people don't have um, – as many children yeah. because they feel like they can't afford them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Interesting. And we'll fact, throw we, some of those links yeah. to the, yeah, uh, absolutely. In we'll the link show these notes. into the show notes. That way yeah. people can, you know, click on that. And I was yeah. pulling up while you guys were talking, I was looking at Y charts here, just pulling up. So like Japan's real GDP versus U S real GDP since ni- 1994 is when this goes back to. And the, you know, Y chart shows U S real GDP is up over 107% over that time period. You know, Japan's uh, real GDP has grown at 25 percent yeah. over that exact same mm-hmm. time period. So, um, yeah, that can explain a lot. There's it's also why you there's know, a lot I mean, to it. Japanese stock market's been uh, right pretty struggling tough, for yeah. a while. tough for a long, yeah. long time. Um, and, and I will say, it, it's always dangerous making a public prediction on a on a podcast that's available to the public. Yeah, we'll but, archive this, <laughs> <laughs> or as they say, mark the tape. The, yeah, that's right. The but, commenters will. <laughs> yeah, but if you just looked at demographics alone, and we've already stated you can't use right. any one single factor. If you just looked at demographics alone, you would predict that the U.S. economy, and therefore, you know, by extension, the U.S. stock market, should be generally trending up and to the right through the late 2030s or so, maybe even early 2040s, mm-hmm. if you just based it off of demographics alone. And yeah. again, that's based on the fact that we had the echo boom that lasted till 1992. Well, what's 1992 plus 50? Yeah. Yeah. It's 2042, yeah. or if you do plus 45, it's 2037. So just based on that factor alone, you would predict late 2030s to early 2040s. So hmm. we'll see. Yeah. Doesn't mean we won't have a recession in, in between sure. now and then. Sure. But it means that if we do have the inevitable, I would even argue healthy recession, it should be relatively short lived, nothing like the long recession that we had post two thousand eight crash. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well and, and real quick on that, so that obviously has impacted a lot of kinda how you see the economy and the markets and um but it's also impacted how we do things here at Mach One. Yeah. You know, from a charitable perspective. Yes. You know, we're very um we pride ourselves in, in being very charitably minded and, and giving back. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with obviously our, our faith and, and what we're, you know, um, what we feel called and, and t- told to do in Scripture. And so that's directly impacted how we try to give back as a firm. So explain a little bit about how those two things have kind of come together, our charitable focus and everything you just kind of laid Yeah. Out. So, um, yeah, in the book, here's the book plug. Mission. Mission focused, purpose driven. Uh, I talk a lot about that. I talked about the demographic stuff we <clears> talked <throat> about, and so you know the the title, mission focused, purpose driven. Our mission at Mach One, y'all probably talked about it on the podcast in the past, is to basically help our clients help you achieve your uh, financial goals and dreams, right? Whether that be for retirement or traveling or whatever it may be. That's that's basically our mission in life, right? Is to help our clients. Um, achieve what they're trying to achieve financially but what's the higher purpose behind it what you know why do we do what we do and how can we how can we have an impact on on the world hopefully that will outlive us and outlive Mach 1 I believe we believe based on what we just talked about that whole demographic thing that if we can somehow influence the next generation if we can reach the next generation um, you you can change your country um, morally uh, financially, uh, you know, economically. And so as a result, we've, we've chosen to partner with what we term uh, Christ-centered, next-generation-focused charities uh, that basically start pre-birth through high school. Uh, so like Loving Choices, we partner with them. We donate money to them every year and serve, help them uh, serve alongside them in certain uh, events uh, during the year. And, um, and it's, it's simply an organization that helps the expectant mother make that loving choice to carry the child to birth um, as opposed to, um, you know, having an abortion or something. Uh, and, and not only does it help her make that choice, but also helps support her after birth to, so that you don't, you're not just like, okay, good job, you, you, good choice, you, made, you carried the, the child now, good luck raising him or her, right? So they help support that mother as well. 
Um, and then we support the call, which you're familiar yeah. with, Matt. Uh, they're a foster care agency that helps uh, come alongside families who've make, made uh, the choice to help take a child who's in the foster care system and provide a home and provide all the resources for them. Uh, I think that's going to be more important as um, states like Arkansas, for example, where it's, it's illegal actually to have an abortion now. Uh, uh, organizations like The Call is going to become even more important, so sure. we partner with them as well. Northwest Arkansas Children's Shelter, uh, we, we support them as well. Uh, CFAC, the mm-hmm. cham- which Lee, Lee is on the board of CFAC Child uh, Family, Family and Advocacy, and Advocacy Center. Center. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, you know, that's also an organization that is supporting the next generation. And then Fellowship of Christian Athletes, or FCA, um, which is one of the last avenues to get the gospel of Christ into, into schools. Uh, so th- we've been very strategic in yeah, a lot what of our higher purpose. Behind, yeah. yeah who you know who we're choosing to partner with uh, obviously for the ultimate goal of you know impacting those children and their families you know spiritually but also the trickle down effect that it can have you know economically yes. financially mm-hmm. um, there's just a lot of benefits to that so it's been really cool to do that and that all it all kind of goes back to your roots of reading that book from yeah there. it really and does I mean, that that's really where it all started that's and right. it's been kind of it's been really cool to see what that's led to and how that's kind of helped focus our trajectory and focus on um, the charitable side of things. So, um, yeah, really good conversation. So I encourage all, you know, all the listeners out there, d- dive into that some and, and, you know, give us your feedback on, on what you think. And like David said, there's not any one thing that you can use to predict the future, whether that's economically or what the stock market's going to do. But um, I think this is a really interesting thing that you can use to help, f- you know, build that overall picture of what you yeah, expect over sure. the coming years so okay so hard pivot from that we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna jump into you know investment expectations um this is a conversation i feel like i'm having a lot it's, i would venture to say even a lot like lately specifically um i think you you maybe tend to have it more when the um when the market's really strong or you, you're coming off of a good year or two, you know, with, with the index is performing real, really well. And that's just, exp, um, you know, investor expectations. Like what should investors, and when I say investors, we're investors, right? So I'm speaking about ourselves too. We're not, we're not um, out of this group of people. But what investors should expect and how they should, you know, benchmark their, um, you know, their returns and their expectations moving forward. So kind of what I mean by this is, you know, the natural tendency for everybody is the S&P 500, yeah. right? We talked about it a couple of weeks ago. It's the one major index that you can turn on any news channel, and that is the primary index people are looking at. We, it's probably the best index when you're looking at just the overall um, U.S. stock market, right? It's yeah. the 500 largest companies. And so that's what people are looking at. And so a lot of people, when they see this, that – that particular index have a really good year or a really good run. They're like, well, I should be doing that, and they're and they they kind of lose sight in the, uh, often of what are their goals, what are they trying to accomplish, what are they comfortable with from a risk perspective, and it just very quickly gets into, well, I should get that. That's what the market's doing. So, yeah. Lee, kind of, what are your initial thoughts or comments on that? I mean, it's it's just what you said. Um, you know, before you said the S and P five hundred, I, I think that is the most common benchmark. Um, or you know, oftentimes you'll just hear what the markets are doing. You'll hear that in, yeah. in general. Well, the markets were up X percent. Um, so many things go into it, like you said, risk tolerance and their objectives, and you know, their time horizon. Blah 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 blah. You know, I think a, another thing that impacts it that that you get this disconnect between reality and expectations is talking to your neighbor, your yeah. coworker. That was Go- the first your thing. Your golfing buddy. Your golfing buddy. Yeah. I mean, you talk to a couple guys and they're like, oh, I was up yeah. 30% last year. I think there's a lot of that. And then in their mind, they're like, well, I didn't get 30%. Yeah. You know, and, and, yeah. and, and to me, the water cooler talk is almost just as dangerous, if not more so, 100%. than just sure. looking at an, an index yes. because – we all do it. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, oh, yeah. how many times have we had clients, great clients come to us who otherwise would be happy, but they're referencing something their golfing buddy said. 
you know, there's a saying that says uh, compare uh, comparison. Well, you might well, have to edit this out because now <laughs> all of a sudden I've forgotten. <laughs> yeah, that, beautiful that, quote. By that David quote. Reed. Comparison breeds discontent. Yeah, that's oh, what okay. it was. Yeah, comparison yeah. breeds discontent. And that's very true. Yeah. Yeah, and, and I think it is. And so, so much of our job, and we've talked about this, you know, when we go to conferences, some of the conferences I've attended, there's more and more sessions on the psychology of investing, yes. not the X's and O's and yeah. what to invest. It's the psychology and it's managing those expectations. And it's not like we're trying to temper expectations. It's just, it's managing them. Yes. To keep clients, you know, in check with with their risk tolerance well, and their it, investment objectives. They're, they're, I feel like so often investing in general is oversimplified, and yes, I think there's a there's a truth to that in that the access to and this is a great thing. This is all positive, so I'm not trying to pitch this as a negative. The access to investing, the cost to invest, all of those things of the barrier to access and entry is way, to, you know, sure. much lower than it used to be. And so in in that light, it is easy. The extremely difficult part that I would venture to, that I would make an argument more difficult now than it probably was 20 years ago when accessing investments was dif- more difficult, making investments, is the psychological component to investing. And that is the part that is easily discounted. Um, and it's, I think, even discounted more so when things are going really well w- sure. with the indexes. And so... <clears throat> Investing is really stinking hard. Mm-hmm. It, it is. And it, and a big component of that is keeping yourself in check with yes. what are your goals? What are your expectations? What should be your expectations? And staying the course and not making irrational decisions at the wrong time. And that that is a very complicated um, and hard thing to do consistently over time. You know, I'll, I'll add two quick things. But, you know, there have been so many instances where I've – where I've met with somebody, whether it's in my office or, you know, on a golf course or, you know, they're like, hey, can you get me 12%, 15%? Yeah. And I'll be like, the answer is yes, but then I'm going to follow that up with, do you have the stomach (laughs) in order to to deal with all the ups and downs that is going to be required? That's right. That's typically going to be the answer is no. And you know what the answer, what I've found the answer usually is in good times? Oh, yeah, I've got the stomach to deal with that. Well, And 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 you know what happens when it actually hits? Yeah. They don't. Yeah. Yeah. Now, some people do. The truth is most people don't. And when you say they, I would put, you know, that's true for ourselves. Sure. Absolutely. And that's why we have like. People in general. That's why we have like at the firm, you know, we have an investment committee, a team of advisors and team of people outside the firm that we consult with and because any one person myself included you put yourself in a in a box and you try to make rational good decisions when things get difficult right you're much less likely to make good decisions than when you surround yourself with a team of advisors or consultants and people that you trust and so that that is i think it's a good reminder now when you know the coming out of a year the market's been good last year it's been pretty good to start the year right the indexes are up i think now instead of waiting till something bad happens now's a really good time to be reminding yourself of this is really hard and you don't want to think things are too good to be uh, you know and going to stay that way forever make make sure you understand what risk you're you're comfortable with surround yourself with a team of advisors you know, and when I say advisors, that could be your, your spouse, sure. your your friends that can help hold you accountable, or it could be a team of actual professional advisors that are going to help you get through those um, situations where it can be really easy to make knee-jerk reactions and you can blow yourself up quickly. Financially. Well, and it, you know, it's not just in the good times. It's also the, the down. I mean, that it, when we're just kind of meandering along, that's when it's not that difficult but it's, it's, it's the extremes. It's, in, it's, it's the, the extremes. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and, and, and one of the bullet points we have on here is, you know, what's a healthy investing mindset? Mindset. It's that is our job truly to manage that within the client. Yeah. And that's why we do those risk profile questionnaires. That's yeah. why we we circle back and look back yeah. to original comments and uh, conversations because it's easy to get caught up in, oh my gosh, buy me NVIDIA. Because yeah. it's up 300%, you know? Well, does that fit in with what you're trying to achieve? Yeah. Maybe it does, but... Yeah. Often yeah. it doesn't. Often it doesn't. But, it doesn't. But, and it's also true on the downside. You know, so many people in a market that's down significantly want 
to bail or they want to yeah. go do something that their buddy told them about. Well, again, it. Yeah. I, I'll give you a perfect, very recent example, and you guys will relate to this. Uh, not too long ago, like a year ago, markets were not doing well. But what was doing good? Fixed interest, fixed interest rates, right? Yep. The Fed had just raised rates. We're getting 5% interest on money markets. And so what we're, you know, decent. A lot of people, that was easy a lot of to people say, were saying, I'll take it. Why would, why would I take all this risk in the market when I can get 5% in money market? Well, I, I mean, we had lots of people, right? Yeah. We're thinking, well, I should just be in. And now what are people thinking? Yeah. Why am I, why am I not getting S&P 500? Yeah, get me return? out of this CD. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and so yeah. it's a great yeah. example of, no, like, yeah, your cash, by all means, go get 5%. Yeah. But, like, your long-term investment dollars, like, don't get into the game That's of, right. hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get 5% while I can. Like, you know, have the long-term plan. Yeah. Have, have a, uh, you know, a sequence of reviewing that and adjusting it yeah. as needed. Um, but it's, it's a good reminder for all of us that yes. investing is really hard. Yeah. And it can be very emotional and it can be very easy to make you know, irrational decisions at the worst possible times. And so yeah. no, just be aware of that and then surround yourself with people and processes and systems that can help you avoid making bad decisions. You know, I had a lady in my office last week and, you know, we were talking and she said, so ultimately your job is to what? And I said, we take the emotion out of yeah, investing. And I I think that's that, a, that kind of sounded cold when I said it, but I said, truly, that is. I think that's a big part of an advisor's job is to help the client take the emotion out of investing. I mean, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're as much, any advisor, any good advisor is every bit as much, if not more so, of just like a coach. Yeah. Yeah. Than they are like. Psychologist. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah, hey, we should buy this or that. That's a part of it. Mm -hmm. But a good advisor should be a really good just coach and coaching yeah. you yeah. through the I mean, ups and downs. Our process, uh, for those of you that are clients, you know this. I mean, there's a reason why we do that retirement analyzer program. And we, I mean, I, I use refer it on refer back to it constantly. Refer to it back to it constantly because we're trying to use that to remind our clients you don't necessarily need a fifteen percent return or whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, if you most most of our clients, if they average somewhere between, and it, you know, it's, it varies. Some clients need a zero percent rate of return and they'll be fine. Some clients might need a six to seven percent rate of return or so and they'll be fine. But but almost nobody needs a. 10 to 12 percent rate of return um i mean we can get that like you said earlier and but and, at what level of risk and, and even though in though even though everybody wants that yeah. most people myself included in in some ways like aren't comfortable with the risk required like i would rather get a slightly lower return with some stability yeah. than just trying to knock the cover off the ball every yeah. year yeah. after year so it, it, you know i don't don't want to you know chase that too far but yeah. i think it's a really good conversation, a good reminder for us. We talk about these things internally all the time, so I wanted to just kind of bring it up yeah, here and kind topic. of remind probably, everybody. Probably a good note to end. The, and yeah. you know, we need to end this segment. There's a really good book. We talked a lot about psych, uh, psychology and how it relates to investing. There's a really good book called The Psychology of Money. Yeah. Uh, maybe we can put By that Morgan in the show Housel. notes. Maybe let's put that in the show notes also. Um, but yeah. Good, it's a good read that we would recommend to listeners. Yeah, for sure. So we're going to tie things up for the sake of time. Um, good conversation today. Yeah. David, good to fun. have you. Yeah, yeah. You should, we should uh, do this more often. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll watch it back and see if we're going to invite you back <laughs> or not. But um, no, it was fun having you. As always, we appreciate you guys listening. Give us a like, like and a subscribe. Share, share the YouTube videos, any videos that you're watching. We'd appreciate your help sharing those on your social media platforms. Um, and check out our YouTube channel, trying to put out a, a lot of content these days. So really having a lot of fun with that. So yep. as always, um, we want to end with something. When I say as always, I usually ignore Zoe's dad jokes. But this one was pretty good, so I am going to actually read it. Um, this one says, why are Irish bankers successful? It says, because their, their capital is always Doubling. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's <laughs> good. Yeah, hopefully somebody got a chuckle out of that. Dub Dublin, <laughs> Dublin, Dublin. All Dublin. right, we appreciate you guys watching. We'll see you next week. <laughs>